Okay, we're gonna try the walking around thing. <laughs> Just to keep everyone awake as opposed to the, the chair version. Um, I am coming from several years working in the field of conflict, conflict resolution and now doing research about it because I have noticed more and more that technology is being used uh, to help resolve conflict, to help prevent conflict, to help manage conflict. Uh, and in a lot of different settings, this there was just a lot of problems that I noticed because of culture. And so I've gone in to do some research to try and figure out why that might be. Uh, and the debate in political science circles, I'm a political scientist, tends to focus on open access, equating the idea of access and participation with freedom because freedom of expression is a pillar of democracy, and then equating any barriers to this freedom with autocracy and uh, evilness. And then you start hearing freedom and democracy, evilness, autocracy, and then maybe Iran and China. And that's where the rhetoric sort of goes. Um, however, I think there are other types of barriers that we need to think about. Because what are we getting access to? And when we have access and we have all this data and information, the form that the information takes can also be some sort of barrier. So. Um, there is, don't get me wrong, there's huge potential for the technology. I'm a big fan of technology. But I think we need to take the user experience in these different settings into account a little bit more in depth. So these are two pictures. Um, one is from an organization here with um, this lovely blue flowing code enveloping the human. This is from an organization called ICT for Peace, and the web designers felt this image embodied peace when technology is used. I think that's also a very interesting sort of art. But <laughs> they work with organizations like the UN and, and many organizations all over the world using technology to transform conflict. And basically when they have a successful platform, they tend to transplant it into different regions uh, with the hope that it can empower people and take different types of information to make policies, uh, do election monitoring, do human rights abuse reporting, e-governance, that sort of thing. The other image over here is taken um, in Rabat, Morocco, and you can see the dots of uh, satellite dishes on top of corrugated tin roofs, and they're also in the skyline, so it doesn't matter whether you have a, a nice apartment or you live someplace that doesn't have running water, you have satellite TV. Uh, and this has an impact because the satellite is indicative of how technology surged in that way and now we're starting to see more and more um, coverage for phones and this on the African continent is how people are accessing the internet is through their phones. I think between January 2011 and January 2012 there was um, a threefold increase of mobile web browsing by phones and that surpassed um, an increase of mobile web browsing for a continent like Asia which includes China. So this is a huge, huge increase in mobile web browsing um, on the continent of Africa, and it's going to be sort of 3G and all that sort of thing, taking into account when we're looking at the user experience, it's more and more on handheld mobile devices rather than the big computer screens. But producers are sort of having this image of what technology can be, and then we've got an on-the-ground image, and, th and they tend to be very far apart. One of the reasons they're far apart is language. So engineers go, well, we, we've solved that. I think when I was walking around in the gallery, it said that there were 270 languages contributing online right now, which is, seems like a really, really big number. Um, one of the first barriers you need to cross to get access and participation and achieve freedom would be the language barrier. So we've got um, a keyboard now for the iPhone in Yoruba, and you can get key ba uh, keyboards for um, your laptops and all sorts of things in other languages. There is an award-winning um, app 
for citizen journalists in Bangla over here. And if you'll notice, it, it really just, it, even if you can't read Bangla, it looks like an app. It has all the right boxes and colors and everything to be considered an app. I know what an app looks like. That's it. Um, over here, we have uh, an interesting program where Al Jazeera English gave cell phones to people on the ground in Somalia and asked them to answer a question and SMS back the answer. They SMS the answer in Somali. People online in um, all over the world were able to translate it into English as a crowd, which is called crowdsourcing. They translated that answer and categorized that answer into these colorful blobs and mapped them so that people reading Al Jazeera English could understand how the conflict was affecting people on the ground in Somalia. So clearly, everyone is, has access, can participate. We've achieved the ultimate equation. Autocracy can't happen here. All the barriers have been surpassed. However, there is an invisible barrier. Still, we have culture to deal with, and how is this different from language? So the software engineering, cognitive linguistics, political science, all are kind of ignoring this X in the middle here, which is culture. Software engineering for a long time is just dealing with one type of user because of where software was and who had access to the internet. But that's really changed now. And a lot of how they understood what users' needs were, how their minds worked, that sort of thing, came from cognitive linguistics or cognitive psychology. And this has to do with our memory, our perception, how we categorize things, um, a lot of that. And it's very culturally determined on our language. And a lot of cognitive linguistics research is based on about 30 languages, which interestingly overlap with the same cultures that software engineering was engineering for at the onset. I think um, there was a slide from one of the earlier talks about where academic journals come from. Same regions. Uh, political science also cares about the same types of things because of the data that comes out of uh, software engineering who cares about cognitive linguistics so that they can understand the users. So political science cares about the data because information is power. <coughs> and in my circle, basically, um, they care about making policies about the information that comes out of all of these different platforms. This is where I went off my notes, I think. Okay, now it would be absurd to think, <coughs> this is, a, this is a, an absurd slide here, it would be absurd to think that someone in Niger greets someone the same way that I do in the US or the way that someone does in China. We all know that's not the case, so why do we expect communication technology to be ubiquitous and the same everywhere? People uh, speak right now about 7,000 different living languages. Our knowledge of how the mind works about languages is based about on about 30 of those, which are cousins, on studies about comparing how an English sp speaker and a Spanish speaker differ, or a Dutch speaker and a German speaker differ. Uh, because those are so related, we tend to think that everyone thinks in the same way. But there are languages that don't have nouns. So how do we get categories when you have to categorize things if you don't have nouns? There are languages that don't have numbers. They couldn't describe the fact that I have two legs versus one or three. That just wasn't an, something they felt was important enough to describe about the world. So how can we count how many Twitter followers we have? Not an important thing. <laughs> um, there are many, many differences, and the first language you learn is what cements the concepts in your brain, okay? And when I tell this to the engineers, I say, that's fine, but we, we've adapted. You can really type in any language now, and, or if you can't now, you will be able to. We've solved that problem. The problem is more conceptual because it's how you remember things. It's how you frame a scheme to tell a story. And in my work in conflict, that is the information, that's the data that's being conveyed. It's 
I saw someone being shot in the alley. My father is in jail. It's people telling stories with details, and it's those details and those stories that get saved as the information. That is the data that's being transferred. <clears throat> So if anything is possible, if, if we have open source and anything is possible, why do we have to squish our stories into the same type of platform time and time again? And I think there are a couple of different reasons for this, and I'm going to illustrate it with an anecdote. Um, the US State Department holds what's called Tech Camp where they go and they take a lot of leaders of software engineering and big firms and they help different activists design new innovative software to democratize, to help human rights workers, um, to do a lot of different projects. And they did one, I think in 2011, in Indonesia. Now I can think of a lot of reasons to do it in Indonesia. The reason they cited was, it had the largest number of Facebook users outside of the US. So it wasn't to innovate, it was to extend the current model of what's going on because it's the package that we understand the data in. This is what it should look like. Here's an example of what a website looks like and this is what forms generally look like. You have the idea at the top ideal at the top. So that's going to be a noun and it's going to be at the top and it's given over at the top for you guys right. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Left. Okay. And <laughs> sorry. Um, and then things that are real, that are based, that are material, what's on the ground happening now, that's going to be at the bottom. Things that are newest, your Twitter feed, always going to be over here. Uh, this is how it's set up. It's the same shape as a paragraph. You have the, the information, um, the, all the assumptions down to the conclusion. Things follow a linear timeline. That um, comes from an American or Western European logic. And there are two things that work here. There's the interface where you receive the information or put information in if it's a form. And there's the underlying structure that negotiates all of these different databases and interacts with the data. Both of those are based on uh, a certain cognitive logic. Uh, so things like the linear timeline, some cultures have a circular sense of time. What would that look like here? Um, in the US, we're very future oriented. So we're always waiting for the next Twitter thing to come up. And I've had people tell me they can't respond to my email because it fell off the screen because it was lost to the oblivion of two hours ago. Uh, so if a culture is very focused on the past, this model doesn't work for them. There, there are any number of things. It's, it's hard for me to describe, honestly, because this is my cognitive model. This is the conceptual model that my brain was formed in because I am a native English speaker. But someone else who speaks another language comes from another culture. It's up to them to design another model. However, the rationale, in my opinion, to stay with some of these models is this is the way we understand data right now, this format when people are asked to tell their stories and squish it into these boxes, to these scrolling bars, to these check and uncheck dichotomies, uh, this is what we can market to. This is the data that is sold for billions and billions of dollars. This is the data as a package that we understand and know and is worth a lot of money and is, and is very, very powerful as it stands now. And what we don't want to happen is for another type to take over that we can't market to. And this brings back to where I started with openness equals freedom and democracy, barriers, censorship equals bad equals China, which would be our competitor, which would be an alternative model and structure which they have developed. That's what we don't want. So this is where I'm gonna close. Um, when designing for conflict settings to really, really think about the user. Um, this is an older slide from Digital Democracy, an organization. Uh, kids came up with this, and people can come by, call in. There's a radio there. 
uh, they call in, they talk on the radio, all the uh, information remains in an oral setting. And it's saved that way. And that's, that's the way they wanted it. Um, and they pass by. There's, there's a transient to it. There are a lot of things that they chose uh, that they didn't feel they wanted to write it down and save anything. Um, it's done where multiple people are there. It's not private. There are a lot of elements to the communication culture that have been respected in the way they, sent, they set up this cycle here. Uh, and I think that that's what is going to make different types of technology more trusted and used in domestic settings for conflict <coughs> resolution. Thank you.